Welcome to Financial Planning Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, certified financial planner, owner and founder of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. Uh, as I always describe, this is an educational show that's fundamentally based on the six areas of financial planning, where you have cash management, tax planning, uh, risk management, investment planning, retirement planning, and estate planning. And this is the second episode of two that I'm pleased to have as my guest, Thomas Bayless, chartered financial analyst, and he is the founder and owner of Cornerstone Investment Research. Thomas, thank you again for joining me. Thank you. Um, as I pointed out in the first episode, uh, Thomas runs a group of chartered financial analysts that we as a firm have hired to serve as our outsourced chief investment officers, and they've done a tremendous job at really adding value to the firm and the services for investment planning and portfolio management that we provide to our clients. Thank you for that, and thank you for joining us today. So. Uh, this is the second episode, mm -hmm. and to um, full disclosure, we're uh, today is Friday, August fifth. Okay, and this doesn't air for another week. So if some data comes rolling in, and you say, "Hey, this is old news." Well, guess what? I'm at least telling you it's August fifth. So um, first episode, we were talking about the recession. Okay, two weeks ago or shall I say it was like Wednesday, July 27th, um, the Fed raised interest rates by three quarters of a percent to help combat inflation, which is sort of the purpose of the episode. The next day, uh, they announced the GDP was negative two, two quarters in a row, which created and sparked a debate as to whether or not we were in a recession. So if you didn't see the prior episode, that's what we're talking about are we or are we not in a recession? And the resulting conclusion was, who cares, okay? <laughs> I mean, we care about how the economy's doing, but who cares whether you define it or not? But um, as I've been saying since the beginning of the year is in my weekly market recap, uh, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is inflation. And it's a mess. So uh, the inflation numbers that we've been hitting, uh, as you can see by the graph, um, these are the highest inflation numbers that we've seen since like 1981, which is more than 40 years. And as you can see by this chart, you know, inflation was hovering for, gosh, almost 30 years under 3 or 4%, and then boom, it spiked. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, with as a result of uh, the massive amount of stimulus that we saw, you know, come into the economy in response to the pandemic, you know, the um, uh, not only did we have tremendous stimulus from a monetary basis from the by the Federal Reserve, but also a tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus that uh, went into the economy, and in fact, we spent more on the war against COVID than we did in World War II. That's remarkable. Uh, and so the amount of money that- World we, War II is a five year, four year war for us, six years. Mm -hmm. And we're sending people overseas and we spent more on COVID, that is remarkable. Yes, and all of that stimulus coming into the economy, you know, uh, had an impact that we're dealing with today in terms of inflation. Well, and I've heard a lot of different things you know, the, the consumer spending a lot of money and, and that's creating a lot of it. Would you say that's the major piece of it? Well, yeah, so we saw a shift during the pandemic where consumers were forced to spend money on stuff instead of services. So they were buying goods, oh, right? right? Because they couldn't go do anything. I mean, the restaurants were closed. I mean, if you were trying to keep your local restaurant in business, maybe you went and got takeout and you brought it home. Right, that's you, about it, but you but, couldn't go to the restaurant. But you couldn't go to the restaurant. So you, you couldn't go, I mean, uh, you know, uh, travel was shut down in large part. I mean, so you saw yeah. far less travel. So well, it was either shut down or you didn't want to go. But yeah, for sure. Either way. And so you saw this, this massive uh, rise in good spending as 
people during the pandemic, they, you know, they invested in uh, more computers because they were working from home. They bought that Peloton because they were exercising from home because their gym was closed. Right. Uh, they, you know, they, uh, they, they bought all of these things because they, they couldn't really go spend money on services. Or they didn't want to go to the stores. So the companies that made out were the delivery companies, UPS, FedEx, and Amazon. For sure, <laughs> for sure, for sure. And you know, while there's been some rebalancing of that as, as we've come out of the pandemic and there's been a rebound in the services, you know, sectors like restaurants and travel and so forth, you know, there's still a fair amount of good spending that's been going on just because of a robust consumer. Well, throw that in. So in other words, you're just creating a greater, a pent up demand. Throw on the supply chain problems. And I know you had said in the last episode that the port of Los Angeles, you had all kinds of ships sitting out there in the harbor. We couldn't get the goods to the stores. I mean, think about sort of jokingly, all of the, you couldn't get paper towels or toilet paper at the store. Which is kind of funny, I, you know. Hey, if I'm thinking I can't get some, I'm not thinking I got to go take all the toilet paper anyway. Just a separate issue. But that was an issue. Yep, and and you know we like to think because we can find most of the things that we want at the grocery store now that supply chain issues are in the rearview mirror. But frankly, they haven't been because we've had other things that have impacted them. So you've had China shutdowns that you know their their kind of zero COVID policy is continue to make it problematic for goods to get, you know, manufactured and out of China. You so know, it wasn't a transporting, it was an actual manufacturing in China. Yeah, for sure. Uh, in addition to that, you've got, um, uh, uh, in addition to the, the China piece, uh, you've got, I lost my train of thought. Uh, well, so the goods are not being transported, they're not being manufactured. What goods specifically were impacted by China shutdown? Was it Beijing that was shut down? Was it Beijing or Shanghai? One, one of the major cities was shut down, which was inhibiting production, okay, and therefore no transportation. What were the major goods that got hit? I, I understand semiconductors, but I'm getting yeah. mixed up between Taiwan and, and China. Well, chips have definitely been a pain point. I mean, and anybody that's tried to buy a car, which was the point that I was trying to come up right. with. Right, okay, there you ago, go. I'm here to help. Um, you know, I, I've got a daughter that graduated from college last year that has needed a car for uh, you know quite some time. And you know, uh, finding cars, whether it's a used car or a used car, a new car has, has, has been astonishingly hard, and we've seen you know dealer markups on new cars, inven low inventory levels. Now that's started to pull back very recently. Yes, I heard that. You know, just a bit. So it's not as bad as it was, you know. But supply chain problems have continued, you know, to impact the amount of supply that's available, and therefore that's been a contributor to inflation. Well, it's very simple. If if there's not enough of something, and a whole bunch of people want to buy it. The people are going to be willing to pay more for it. Perfect example is the housing market. Look at that got out of control, in my opinion, out of control. So um, yet people will pay anything to get the house. So that created that. But part of the demand was, as you pointed out, it was a pent up demand. But I remember seeing a graph that had and I know the Fed can somehow measure this, whether it's through the banks, I'm sure there is, but they measured how much money is out there as far as savings, checking, and, and CDs and stuff like that. And it was cruising along at 800 billion and zoom, shot yep. up to 4 trillion, yep. just like that. And that was the pandemic, that was the stimulus from two pieces. Here's extra money, but you can't spend it on anything. Mm -hmm. Now they're spending it. How much has that come down, do you know? So uh, there's still a significant surplus there. The last chart that I saw, I think, put it between two and three trillion. I thought so. Okay, that's what I thought too. Yep. So, but the other piece, you know, when it comes to inflation, that you know, that we talked a little bit about in the last episode, is energy prices. You know, the the Russian invasion of Ukraine created a commodity price spike that was felt around the globe, um, and you know, the biggest impact that we faced here was the price at the pump. Um, so we saw gas prices shoot up to over five dollars a gallon on a national average at some point. You know that plays a role um, in the headline inflation numbers that we see, and was a contributor to us getting over nine percent in terms of year-over-year -year CPI in June. Oh, that, that was crazy! And so it's it's what people may not realize is that it's not just the gasoline that you pay, or that we pay when we go to the pump, but it's also the fuel for the trucks 
that transport all the goods. Absolutely. And it is also the fuel that is used to generate electricity to power all the manufacturing plants, to flip the lights on, to turn on the AC. And so the increased cost really works its way all the way through the economy. That is ridiculous. Now, um, keep referring to the 800-pound gorilla being inflation. And I remember, I think it was the March inflation number was 8.5, and then, or 8.5, 8 8 then April was 8.3, and everybody was expecting it to come back down and continue on a trend down, and then all of a sudden, boom, it hits 8.6, went up, head fake, and it destroyed the markets. Yep. Well, yes, and, and a lot of people got faked out by that. And, and you know, the, the other thing I think that was the big surprise for markets was the fact that, uh, you know, the, the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, seemed very sensitive to headline CPI in a way that we hadn't seen before. Historically, the Fed had really focused more on core inflation because that tends to be more stable. Has less is less impacted by things like food and energy prices that tend to be very volatile. Is that the difference between for the viewers the core and the headline? I'm sorry, headline includes food and energy. Yes, core is everything but. Yes, exactly. But how can you exclude food and energy when they represent such a large component of the inflation? Well, and I think that's you know where Fed Chair Powell was going and acknowledging it because it's so front and center for everyone, you know that is you know uh, the, you know the average Joe. I mean, going to the gas pump. Uh, going to the grocery store. And so how can you say that inflation is moderating when you look at core numbers when the, the, you know, the headline numbers are so high and, and people are so impacted by the headline numbers? I mean, when it costs you $100 to fill up your gas tank, that's meaningful for a lot of people. So what you do is you only fill it halfway, <laughs> okay? So, so in the prior episode, you referenced that your measure of inflation is when your wife comes home from the grocery store. The reality is that since my grocery shopping is not exactly consistent every time, I don't recognize it. You know what I mean? So I'm not always going and buying the exact same thing. But so the Fed, the job of the Fed is twofold. What is the Fed's job? Yeah, so, you know, they're looking to create stable prices and full employment. All right. So here we are. Stable prices are non-existent. So this goes back to Volcker, who had the courage in 1980 and 81. What did he raise interest rates? 12% in like a year and a half? Was that, was that what it was? It was something crazy like that. Yeah. Uh, Volcker certainly, I mean, he raised interest rates, I think, 6% over a weekend or something at one point. And That's just, crazy. You know, just so, but numbers that were, they were dealing with double digit inflation too. I know. And so they had to find a way to get the inflation numbers down, and that was by increasing short term rates to exceed them. Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, no, but it was also a very effective job. So what he did was very effective, and yeah, we're not there yet, but the Fed has consistently been raising interest rates and doing other fiscal policy by not buying bonds, and now they're selling them back in, which is sort of subtle, and it's behind the scenes, because we don't see it. When, all we hear, we being the general public, hears the announcement that the Fed is raising rates. So. How many times have they raised rates already this year? Well, we saw them, they went a quarter point at first, then half a point, and then they've done two, three quarter point increases uh, in June and July. Uh, so that's two and a quarter percent that they've raised already. Mm -hmm. And so the next meeting is in the in end September. of September. Mm -hmm. So the, the talk of it is what, half a percent, three quarters percent? Well, I think with the, str the strong jobs number that we saw earlier today, you know, it's hard to say that the you know, that the economy is in a recession when you have 3.5% unemployment. Right. Half a million, over half a million new jobs created last month, or in June, I think that number was four. Um, and so it's, it's hard to say that the economy is slowing the way it, the Fed needs it to. And part of the Fed's challenge is, is, is that it can only impact aggregate demand, you know, uh, indirectly in terms of the cost of funds. You know, the Fed can't control how much oil is available or how much refinery right. capacity there is. It can only control aggregate demand. And so, you know, those, it, you know, fortunately we've seen energy prices come back down in terms of pump prices, um, you know, over the last several weeks. But, you know, there's only so much they can, can do to control that. And in, unfortunately, some of the activity by the Fed that we've, from the Fed that we've already seen this year 
is going to have an even stickier impact on inflation um, you know, through owner equivalent rent. Yes, so, and, and back to the gas prices, that the gas prices impact you and I and everyone today, but it's a slower impact if it's the truck that delivers the goods and even the tankers or the planes, whatever, and by the time it makes it all the way down to the price that you pay in the store is delayed, it's going to take a little while for that to, to seep in. Is that correct? Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's, there's no doubt that um, companies, uh, especially uh, companies in the goods sector, have been taking prices up in, you know, to preserve their margins, but there's only so much of that they can do. Right. Uh, um, and as you know, demand and supply come further back into balance. You know that you know will, will tend to moderate. But you know the the inflation numbers that we that we've seen this year. I mean, there are certain parts of it that are stickier than others. Um, and and we talked about owners equivalent rents a little bit. I'd like to build on that. So when the Fed raised interest rates a couple of months ago, we saw a shoot up in mortgage interest rates. Uh -huh. uh, where you know it used to be uh, you know the mortgage rate was. You know, Shy of three was, was just you know around three percent, and it right. shot up to almost double, or it was in the mid fives. And some of that activity actually pushed your marginal home buyer out of the market and kept them in the renting space. Right. And so again, supply and demand. If you've got more people that need a, f a finite right. number of rental units, then rents are going to go up. Right. And so the owner equivalent rent makes up a huge portion of the consumer price index. And some of those numbers are baked into the cake for a while. And so it's unlikely that we're going to see those numbers come down sharply anytime soon. Those numbers tend to be very sticky. Yeah. Um, and, you know, combined with the fact that, you know, these fuel prices as they spread through the economy in terms of like, you know, things like food at home, another, you know, part of, uh, of the CPI that has seen significant increases this year are, are likely to stay for a bit. Yeah. So we're up against break. What I'd like to do is, is pick up where we left off, and um, when we come back from break, we'll talk more about the inflation and the Fed's job of trying to control inflation. So we'll be right back with you in just a few moments. Have you saved enough for retirement? Are you financially prepared for an emergency or unexpected event? Have you thought about your financial future? Hi, I'm Mike Menninger, founder of Menninger & Associates Financial Planning. For over 20 years, we have been answering our clients' questions just like these as we develop unique and comprehensive financial plans tailored to meet their needs. When addressing your financial plan, we incorporate your entire financial picture, including taxes, estate planning, as well as investment planning and retirement planning. So call us today for a complimentary no obligation consultation. A unique approach to financial planning. Welcome back to Financial Planning Explained. I'm your host, Mike Menninger, certified financial planner, and I'm pleased to be joined here with Thomas Bayless, chartered financial analyst. So where we left off, we were talking about, um, I don't want to say runaway inflation, but we've had some pretty significant inflation. So for the viewer, I like to uh, kind of use my analogy of why the Fed raises interest rates when, when we've got it to combat inflation. So I reference the economy is like a fire burning. And the Fed can control the fire with a fire hose and their fire hose is controlling interest rates. So if the fire starts burning out of control being the economy, that usually will cause inflation to go up. So they break out the fire hose to blast the fire by raising rates to control the fire. And then similarly, if all of a sudden the fire is burning out and we're approaching a recession, what they'll do is they'll pull back on the fire hose to allow the fire to begin growing again. The fear that investors have is that the Fed is notorious for putting the fire out. 
<laughs> okay? And so they, 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 they say it's, it's not if, how, it's, it's what the Fed does to put out the recession. The Fed always causes the damn recessions is kind of what happens. And that's the concern. So when the Fed is raising rates, they see inflation. Investors see inflation. They say, uh-oh, the Fed's going to step in. And uh-oh, the Fed has a history of putting the fire out and driving us into recession. And so that was the topic in the prior episode. Are we in a recession? And I think we can all agree, probably not, despite the two consecutive negative GDPs. However, all of these raising of interest rates don't happen overnight as far as their impact on the economy. And there's probably a lot of reason to believe that it may drive us into a recession. Do you agree with that? Uh, there's certainly uh, a, a significant likelihood that that could happen. I mean, the the challenge is 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 that the economy is it's it's like turning like a, a super tanker. Yes. You know, I mean, it, it moves. I mean, the adjustments that the feds are making, feds making, have a very very slow impact. It's not like just flipping a switch and all of a sudden, you know, uh, growth comes down. I mean, it takes a while for it to seep through. And I think the fear is, is is that the Fed will continue to monitor the incoming data, and and see you know uh, uh, continued high CPI or uh, you know con- uh, low confidence or what have you that uh, there's all kinds of stuff that the Fed looks at, uh, but not seeing it moved quick enough to suit them, and therefore continue to hike rates maybe further than they would need to if they were just a bit more patient. And then putting out the fire. So we just pulled up the graph here, which shows the Fed rates for the last, however, is it 30 years or since 2000, is it? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. Okay. So you can see that we've had, what was it, like 6 or 7% back in 2000, which if we were to go back even further, that's pretty much par, isn't it? You know, the um, we certainly do seem to be in a in a era of lower for longer in terms of interest rates. I don't know that we'll ever get back to, you know, benchmark interest rates being six, seven, eight percent like they were. I think the government probably has too much debt to allow that to happen. Right. Actually, that's a good point. <laughs> um, you know, but nevertheless, um, you know, there's 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 absolutely no doubt that interest rates um, are going to have to go higher than they are. There's a lot of discussion around what the neutral rate is and you know that there was a comment in last week's press conference even from uh, Fed Chair Powell that you know that we were approaching the neutral rate uh, that was neither stimulative nor restrictive to the economy and then we turn around and we have a, a jobs number come out like 528,000 jobs and three and a half percent unemployment and it's hard to think that you know that we're st- we're in neutral territory right now given the strength uh, and the robustness of the job well, market. Well, so, so the way I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong or support it, is that the Fed wants to control inflation and they raise interest rates to control inflation, but they're afraid that the jobs number, the unemployment will go up. And they don't want unemployment to go up, but as long as unemployment is still really low, then the Fed has full control of that fire hose. And so that's what you're saying. Yeah, and we've even seen that in, in response to markets. It's, it's, we're in this crazy cycle of bad news is good news and good news is bad news. And so toward the end of July, you know, we saw um, you know, equity markets you know, uh, rise significantly yeah. in, in the face of bad news because the thought was is that if more bad news was coming out, then the Fed would become less hawkish and, and be um, you know, uh, tempted to raise rates less high. Um, and then, like earlier today, um, you know, we saw that the, the, the jobs number come out and immediately futures, you know, uh, were, were, went sharply lower. Of course, because they know that now the Fed has is, is got open season to start raising the interest rates and they're not going to, you know. So on that note, we're talking about the Fed raising rates and and that was having an impact, inflation and all these different things, the economy is slowing. And then out of the blue, June 15th, the markets sort of hit their bottom and the markets have grown by like 10% since then, haven't they? Uh, Markets are up sharply since the middle of June, there's no doubt. Um, And in fact, as of this taping, I think, you know, um, we've had a rebound that's close to double digits from the lows. Um, But I would tell you that um, 
I personally don't understand it. Like, I don't believe it either. I mean, I, it's just, it's hard for me to, I scratch my head because I, I really had, I, I try to avoid predicting, but you know, I was anticipating this summer would be a lot of sideways movement back and forth because I didn't see real catalysts for the markets to go higher until we saw that the Fed had a handle on inflation and had more certainty around the path of future interest rates. Right. And, you know, if there's, if there's one thing I've learned over the years is that the, the market's ability to be irrational is far stronger than my ability to re remain solvent in the face <laughs> of it. <laughs> no um, kidding. I, you know, I, I didn't understand it. It made no sense to me. And then it even goes to so that the market is a leading indicator predicting where the economy is going to be in six to nine months. I have a hard time believing that the economy is going to be raging in six to nine months from now. If anything, there's reason to believe that the economy is going to be worse in six to nine months than it is today. Well, and you see that reflected actually in the Fed futures funds rates. And so, you know, right, the Fed puts out, let me back up. So the Fed puts out a, what's known as a summary of economic projections where they anticipate the likely path of monetary policy to be. And, you know, they, um, you know, they estimated that rates were going to be toward the end of the year toward Oh, uh, somewhere around 3.4%. Um, you know, if you look at futures rates, they're actually coming down next year. They're anticipating right. that the Fed's going to reduce rates because they uh, because the economy will uh, be be slowed down into a recession. Right. So that's kind of unusual. So you figure here we are in August, six to nine months is early next year. You figure six months is February, nine months is May, and I know what you're talking about because I heard the same thing. They were actually projecting based on those derivatives or whatever it is that they're doing, that they're actually going to do a rate cut in March. When does the Fed do a rate cut? A Fed does a rate cut when the economy needs stimulus. Well, if the economy needs stimulus, why is the market going up today predicting that we're going to be better off in six to nine months? Well, because markets price in advance the likelihood that rates are going to come back down and lower rates are generally constructive for equity markets because you know you have um, forward cash flows that are discounted at a lower rate. Right. Borrowing costs are lower. And so the thought is, is that lower rates, you know, rates coming down are, are constructive for equities. Okay, well, that's still counterintuitive to where we think we're going to be. So next week comes out the inflation data for July. And I tend to think, what's the consensus? The last month it was 9.1. What is the consensus for July's inflation data? Do you know? Well, the, uh, it depends on who you read. I mean, but the, the, at least the most recent data that I've seen is folks are anticipating that it might retract slightly. You know, that we may have- Only slightly. Seen, yeah, that we, we, might see, we might have seen a peak. But again, the, uh, I mean, there's so many numbers that are baked into it that can't come down, like rents, for example. There's a lagging impact in there yeah. in the owner equivalent rents. That's a significant portion of, of CPI. And so even though we've seen gas prices come down, that's only a part of what goes into CPI. And well, so I remember you were referencing, um, and I know we have a slide on this, there's how much uh, is considered sticky and what is considered transitory. Mm -hmm. And transitory were those things like food and energy. Mm -hmm. Whereas the sticky you're referencing was the rent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and ostensibly you eventually have base effects that creep into food and energy. I mean, you know, gas is if you know gas may have gone up to four or five dollars. It's not going to go up to six or seven dollars, uh, at least not likely. There it is. There's uh, the chart. Yep. So and, and so the, those green numbers along the top of the chart, those energy prices, that's likely to get skinnier right. as a part of the bar. Uh, same with some of the other uh, numbers at the top of the chart, but those numbers at the bottom, when you take a look at at, um, at owner's equivalent rent, which is the very base of that chart. Uh, when you take a look at you know, some of the other things like services, those, those, those numbers are likely to be stickier for a while longer. So it's gonna take longer for them to go away. And so I think I had seen some numbers also they were projecting. If you're looking at the graph, you could see that the green got bigger. Yeah. And now is the f food and the energy growing, but the other ones were getting bigger, but slowly getting bigger. Those are the ones that are gonna take longer. Um, I believe I also saw projections of the end of 2023, or is it tw 2022, that inflation would be back down to 5.4? Is that what you saw? 
Well, I mean, if you take a look at the Fed's sum of, uh, summary of uh, economic uh, conditions, they were projecting that uh, core PCE was going to be down to 4.3% by the end of 2022 and then down to 2.7% by the end of 2023. And so now they use the personal, uh, the PCE personal consumption expenditures, which is a little bit different than CPI, uh, but that tends to be their more preferred m method of inflation. Uh, completely separate note, and for those of you who are on Social Security, I heard some really good news for you. Okay, this is the, the, the preamble. I heard that Social Security is gonna go up about 10% next year. I don't know if you heard that. Well, but From your lips to God's ears, right? Well, you know, we'll see what happens. But, you know, they're looking at whatever the, the Fed uses. I don't know if it's the Fed for not the same Fed, but the government uses. Uh, they're talking about potentially breaking into a 10 percent increase for senior citizens, which I, you know, I'm glad to see that mm -hmm. for the retirees. And, and many of my clients are collecting Social Security. But well, and hopefully they don't lose it all to the, uh, the Medicare premiums. Well, no kidding. No, that's a separate <laughs> issue. I know they went up quite a bit last year too. So um, what other impacts can we see? Like talking about September and, and you know, the Fed is not supposed to be political. Okay, they're not supposed to be political, but the September is the next time they meet, which is also the only time they meet before the midterms. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize what they're going to do. Do you think they're going to be politically motivated at all? I don't think so. I mean, I think if it were a, pre a presidential election year, you might have that might have more of an impact on their, their thinking process. But, you know, for midterms I, I, and the distance between the meeting and the actual election itself, I, I can't imagine that's going to play a significant role in their in their decision making, especially in light of such strong, uh, you know, jobs data that we've seen earlier right. today. Well, it's going to be important, too, I believe. Uh, if the Fed meets on Wednesday, September 21st, the uh, the inflation data comes out the prior week. Yeah, for sure. So the Fed will have at least had a couple more pieces of inflation data to come rolling in before it makes that decision, as well as more jobs data. Yep. Well, and, and Fed Chair Jerome Powell's made it very clear that they're, they're taking it meeting by meeting and they're being very data dependent. Uh, so... You know, I, I think uh, a lot of folks had predicted that 50 basis points was probably going to be coming in September. I think with the jobs number like today, you got to keep 75 in the mix. Yep. But there's still a lot more data to come in between now and then. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, we're wrapping up here, if you can believe that. Is there anything else that you think you want to add as it pertains to the inflation and the impacts on the markets? And I, Actually, I do want to throw in one thing. What, what does inflation or a rise in interest rates causes the market t to go down. Explain why. Well, as interest rates increase, borrowing costs for you know companies increase, and so you have to factor that in. But more importantly, uh, you know, a, a stock's value is a function of its future cash flows. And the more forward in the future those cash flows are, the more heavily they're impacted by interest rates. And so we discount those cash flows back to come up with a present value that a stock should be worth today. And so as rates go up, then uh, those stocks that have uh, cash flows that are very heavily into the future are more strongly impacted. Uh, so, you know, uh, rising interest rates can be challenging for equity markets. But at the same point, there's still parts of the market that make sense uh, to remain invested. And if you're a long term investor, you know, it's where you have to be is you have to stay invested overall. But Parts of the market like utilities and real estate, they're, they're largely able to pass on those inflation costs to their end users. And so uh, those sectors are widely invested in by, for example, value funds. Right. And so if you've got value in your portfolio, and most investors do, they're getting access to, they're getting exposure to those sectors. Well, the other thing too, the interest rates and, and referencing future cash flows, um, the higher PE stocks also are those that are impacted more. Sure. You know, what's a high PE stock? Your growth stocks. Mm -hmm. You know, those that either don't pay dividends or have a very high expected growth mm -hmm. relative to their earnings or low earnings, those are the ones that get cremated. And as measured, if you compare, not that it's a true measure, measuring stick, but the NASDAQ are mostly growth stocks. Mm -hmm. So you see that the NASDAQ's down probably almost 25% year to date, 30% since its peak, mm -hmm. whereas the Dow, which is a little bit more on the value push, 
your big behemoths that are distributing dividends, that didn't get hurt as much. Yeah. Well, and we like growth, but we like smart growth. And so we like growth that actually has real products, uh, that has real earnings. And so I think there's still pockets that are investable within growth, but that's just why it's important to always make sure that you've got a diversified portfolio where you've got exposure to both value and growth in it. Absolutely, as we do all the time. Thomas, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I thank all the viewers for joining us uh, for two episodes. We were talking about, uh, the first episode we were talking about um, the recession, are we in a recession, and what are the impacts, and so on and so forth. And then this episode, we're talking more about inflation and the Fed's response and what impact it also has. So recognizing that you know, your investments, it is not all about the investments, but the investments help arrive to where you're gonna be in the future. It's all part of the overall piece. It's one piece of the overall financial planning, and, but it's a very important part. And understanding how your investments are doing and why they're doing what they're doing is also a very important part. So thank you again, Thomas, for joining us today. And thank you to the viewers for joining us. And we will see you next, next week. Thank you.